Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Reniker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. Here we go, Brownies. Here we go. Hoo, hoo. Yo, Dog Pack. Die Hard Dogs. Browns backers worldwide. It is another Throwback Thursday, and I am Kenny Mack. You'll see me sprinkled through some Dogs podcasts here and there, and I love talking Browns. Like I mentioned, I contribute to the show once in a while, and I also run the Browns backers up here in Ottawa. It's a chapter through Browns backers worldwide, so that's the official sponsor of uh, the fan clubs, I guess, across the world. I sit on that leadership group that oversees all these other chapters and kind of helps them out and gets them ready for game day. And uh, so let's get back to Throwback Thursdays. I started this in my group, my Browns backers group, and I used to profile a player every Thursday. Uh, Now I'm doing it for you. So basically what I like to do is I like to give gratitude to the dogs that kind of grinded it out through the good and the bad. Obviously, we've had more bad than good of of late, but the good has been there for the last four years. So let's take a look. We'll take a look at the player's history. We'll reminisce about the plays that were made. We'll see how they're doing now. And once in a while, I like to throw in or dive in and imagine, hey, what if these guys were on the current team? But before we get started, let's talk about the podcast. The podcast is real close to 10,000 subscribers. That would mean a lot. So I just need you to take one second to hit that subscribe button and don't be shy. Leave a comment. Let us know how we're doing. Find us on the socials if that's your thing. So Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, you guys know all that stuff. You can leave a comment there too. Tag us on it. We'll find you. Last but not least, check out the website. It is thedogspodcast.com. And what can you do there? Man, there's a ton. Check out the merch store. Treat yourself. Leave a voicemail. That's how I got started. I started leaving intros. Or just leave like any topic you want, to be honest with you. Last but not least, from the website, you can join the dog pack. That's where I'm part of. Uh, we got a, we're in the Discord app. We talk about stuff all day long. Uh, there's a smokehouse. So we talk about cooking. We talk about other um, uh, sports like the Indians are doing really well. I'm a Jays fan. Uh, they're not doing so good. Uh, we talk about movies, a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're bored, jump in there. We got somebody to talk to all the way from Scotland, all the way to Canada, and all through the United States. So let's get this. One place that I learn a lot is the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and that's located, if you don't know, in Canton, Ohio, the birthplace of football. This community is so passionate and Dover's just down the road where the studio is so these guys are just as passionate that made this podcast they actually in the mid 60s raised 400k and that doesn't seem like a lot of money now but that's equivalent to 300 no not 300 3.1 million by today's standards the setup back then was two rooms about 19,000 square feet and now it is a gaudy 118,000 square feet. It has a game day stadium, a a cinescope screen, large merch gift shop, and it's got tons of theaters to show tons of different things about the NFL. It's also got this amazing Hall of Fame village that kind of accompanies it. If If you don't know what it's like, Go down to Gillette Stadium. They have like this little village where you can do shopping and everything. It's the exact same thing. So if you're hanging out there for a Hall of Fame event or if you're hanging out there because there was a concert, big time high school game, you can go to anywhere and restaurant, shop, have a good time. But they did have a huge event this past March. And it was a collaboration with the Cleveland Browns. And it was helped to celebrate our storied franchise. All said and done, I mean, this franchise is still number eight in, I think, winning percentage. I'd have to check that out. But, you know, in the 2000s, we had two really lean years in that decade. The the Legacy Unleashed kicked off with the guitar smash on March 15th, and they had Browns alumni players every week from the 15th to April 29th. And that started off with the most recent one of the most recent alumni, P. 
Peyton freaking Hillis. And that's who we're going to profile today. It was a session that our very own Blake Renneker attended. Aside from him and Josh Cribbs, who is another recent alumni, and we profiled him last week, there were two current players, and they ended off the session. It was Luke Whipler and Deshaun Dewan Jones from the Ohio State. Both, both him and Cribbs, so Hillis and Cribbs, they played on that dysfunctional 2010 team. But once Hillis hit the scene against the Ravens, man, it was fun to see what that guy could do. So let's dive into that short but sweet time. So Peyton Derek Hillis, he was a mid-80s baby born in January. This guy drew a lot of attention while playing at Conway High School in Conway, Arkansas. He was described as determined and consistent. He was a very powerful, natural athlete. And this is wild. I mean, you must get powerful from this. This guy trained by tying vehicles to his waist and pulling them down the street. I mean, I played high school football. I did not train like that. That's for sure. He did have all state honors in baseball as well. So as you see, like these guys are not just concentrating on one thing. It's always are very good in something else, but football was his path. He was the rated best fullback in the nation. He was the third best prospect in his, the entire state of Arkansas. And he was named the offensive player of the year by the Arkansas democratic Gazette. I guess that must be the paper in Arkansas. As uh, for his junior and senior, uh, senior season, he got a ton of recognition because he was all-conference, all-state, and all-Arkansas in both those years in high school. He was on everybody's map. I mean, I know Alabama was looking at him. I know Tennessee was looking at him. I think some of the Florida schools were looking at him. But to the chagrin of many, he decided to stay close to home That's right. He signed as a Razorback. This was a bit surprising. And yes, he did play fullback, but he was a running fullback. He did some blocking, but he was running the ball, and that's what got everybody's attention. But going to Arkansas at the time, they were loaded at running back. They had Felix Jones. They had Darren McFadden. And, you know, he was like all these other guys that we have profiled. I mean, Death Northcutt comes to mind. Josh Cribbs, we just spoke about him. They all started as freshmen. So he added 200 yards, 240 yards, and 97 yards receiving. And you're like, ah, whoop-de-doo, that's not a big deal. It's pretty big for a freshman. The other thing is he scored eight freaking touchdowns, man. That is a SEC record. And that's that's a tough thing to do that in as a freshman. As a sophomore, he was blocking for Smith and McFadden. He managed to put up 947 all-purpose yards. They got him on the field any way they could. And all-purpose means everything. So that means rushing, receiving, kickoff, punt. He did it all. Seven touchdowns. Junior year, not much to say. Nagging injuries, didn't play much, didn't even break over really 300 years, 300 yards across everything. So he was back to himself in his, se- in, his, in his senior year, still helping to pave the way for McFadden, who gained his third consecutive thousand rushing yards. And Jones also got his second. So they already had 2,000 yards combined in the running back position. And then combined yardage overall for Peyton Hillis, he dropped in another 800 and scored seven TDs. That must have been wild watching that Razorback team. They actually beat the number one team, LSU, even though they had a disappointing season for them at eight and five. In that game, though, against LSU, he shone, basically scoring four touchdowns. He had 11 carries for 89 yards. And then he would add in the receiving 62 yards. So it was the biggest victory for Arkansas and the first time they beat a number one team since 81 and they defeated Texas. So let's take a quick look at his measurables. He's getting ready for the draft and oddly enough, I'm looking at him and he reminds me very close to Aiden Robbins. And as you know, Aiden Robbins could have been drafted. He just missed out. But both these guys are about six, they're over six feet. They're over 237 pounds. 
Their arm length is about 33 inches. They got a they got about the same hand size, but they're 40 yards about this the same too. But when you're looking, I think when NFL GMs are looking for running backs, they're looking for something, you know, 4-4. Four, 4-5 four. Four, at the most, but these guys are 4-6, but they're big. They're 240 pounds. They're battering rams. And imagine if Robbins can do some just half, let's say half of what Hillis did in that 2010 season. But we're going to take a quick break here. Let's hear what the sponsors got to say, and then we'll get back into what happened in his pro career. This episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Dog pack, the summer's in full swing, and you guys know what that means. Omaha Steaks annual hotter than fire sale. Go to omahasteaks.com right now, and for a limited time, you guys can get big savings on great packages from Omaha Steaks for just $99. Plus, you guys can get an extra $10 off that order with promo code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, at checkout. So these packages with that promo code are essentially $89. From exquisite steaks to legendary burgers, the premium pork, the air chilled chicken, the the meatballs, the chicken wings, the appetizers, the ready-to-eat meals, the wine, everything that Omaha Steaks has to offer Head over there today, check it out. Shop the Hotter Than Fire sale to get these exclusive savings on the mouthwatering packages that start at just $99 plus. Use that code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, when you check out for an extra $10 off your order. But hurry, because this sale is only available for a limited time. Summer always flies by, and this deal is going to fly by, so you're not going to want to miss it. Go shop today, omahasteaks.com. Use promo code DOGS at checkout for an extra $10 off your order. Hey guys, we are back and let's get into the draft. So unlike Aiden Robbins, Peyton Hillis, he did get to hear his name called and it was midway through the seventh round. He was the 227th pick in the 2008 draft. The Denver Broncos took the scout.com number 76 player, Peyton Hillis. And it was kind of odd how they got him. Basically, they had the rights to Jake Plummer, and he was a quarterback the previous year. He was undecided of what he was going to do the following year because he was getting to be in the league for quite a long time. Ultimately, Tampa Bay said, we will give you a seven if you give us the rights to Jake Plummer. We'll give you a fourth if he actually plays for us. They ended up getting a seventh so you can figure out what happened. Oddly enough, he reminds me of Mike Allstott. I don't know if they that guy was on their radar, Peyton Hillis, but that would have been maybe a nice addition for them since they haven't had him in a while. Another backstory is Eddie Royal. He was drafted by the Denver Broncos. He was the 42nd pick overall, but Scout.com had him at number 77, one below Peyton Hillis. Funny how the draft goes, right? The other two... two, uh, two um, Running backs of note to, that were ahead of him, way ahead of him, was Jamel Charles and Ray Rice, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Interestingly enough, though, reading his draft reports, a lot of articles mentioned high character, special teams beast, highly versatile, and sitting behind Cecil Sapp, he could be one of the best fullbacks in the league. Well, guess what? He didn't have to sit by him because he started the year off at fullback. He was the number one fullback. His first big breakout game, that was on November 8th. He would receive 116 yards and score a touchdown. Two weeks later, after a ton of injuries, number 22 would have a 129-yard performance against the Jets. He would be named Diet Pepsi Rookie Player of the Week and FedEx Ground Player of the Week. And after four highly touted games, Hillis was on a roll until they met the Chiefs, and that dude got sandwiched in a tackle. One up, one down. Brandon Carr, Jared Page, and that tore his right hammy. It was a three-inch tear, and he was on the IR for the rest of the year. After that, that injury ravaged team. That was a Mike Shanahan team. He did not make it, and that was the end of the Mike Shanahan air. So what would happen 2009, that saw Kent area Josh McDaniels come over from the Patriots and become the head coach. One thing that McDaniels didn't do, he didn't really notice Hillis's existence that entire year. You guys aren't going to believe this. 13 carries, 54 yards, because he liked Noshaw Marino and Corral Buckholder a lot better. There was some speculation from fans that there was a rift between Hillis and the rest of the Shanahan holdovers 
against the coach. Well, it didn't really matter because the Browns saw something in Hillis and they traded the much maligned Brady Quinn and they also received a sixth round pick in 2011 and a conditional 2012 pick depending on how Brady played and if you don't recall what those picks turned into Jason Pinkston and Ryan Miller were the two picks and they were both guards I believe they're both on the offensive line now get ready for this it is the 2010 season and this is what we're waiting for so the Browns had a gut feeling after those five games that they saw Peyton see that significant playing time the Broncos went four and one and would that translate to them how would it happen the Browns were super jammed at running back do you guys remember 2010 or do you remember these names Jerome Harrison of course you remember that name James Davis yes Chris Jennings had a couple good games here and there. After I think we picked him off the Packers. And then we drafted Montario Hardesy. So where is this guy going to play? Well, it pretty much started off like it did in with the Broncos. It was a repeat of his rookie year. So many ball carriers, so he started at fullback. And I think he was really designated as a tight end H-back, kind of a do-it-all type of guy. But two very early injuries to Harrison and Davis thrust Hillis into the starting position in week three against the Ravens. Oh, my God. When do you want to start? What team do you want to pick? You want to pick the Ravens at any time? No, thanks. Well, guess what? They had their hands full, and Hillis went off for 144 yards. That was on only 22 freaking carries. He had a touchdown, not to mention he had seven, seven receptions for 36 yards, and they just battering rammed him through that Ravens defense, and they had an almost a near upset. The following week, Hillis would rack up another 100-yard effort, a touchdown, and the first year over the division Bengals. What would Hillis do next? The Falcons kind of bottled him up a bit. He had 80 combined yards and a receiving touchdown, but he would have one of his signature moments, and everybody knows that swing pass to the flats. Saw this 240-pound barrel of a man jumping over a would-be tackler to gain 15 yards. We got that freaking picture up in our bar, in our backer bar, for game day. But next up was the Steelers, and that was a lopsided affair. So really, the Browns at this point... They were had one win. I think they had about five losses. Fans were already calling for Mangini's head. I mean, this guy was stellar with the Jets, and now what, what's going on? And what do we have next? We had New Orleans, one of the best teams in the league. And then we had the Patriots after that. The New Orleans game was wild, and for whatever reason, the Cleveland Browns, from my memories and my 48 years on this planet, have always played well there and the reason i say it was wild because drew Brees, i don't see this very often he threw four frigging interceptions two were to david boeing's 265 pound linebacker david boeing's who took two to the house even the punter would chip in with a big play he had one carry for guess what 68 yards hillis would run receive and even complete a pass it was wild. Number 40 would combine for 83 yards and a touchdown. So it was bye week. They were feeling good. They beat the Saints in the Saints in the Superdome. So what was next? Ugh, the 6-1 and one Patriots. Now, they did this with Colt McCoy last week, and they were starting a rookie, and rookies do not fare well against Bill Belichick. But... Peyton Hillis must have smelled the U, the LSU in the air because he thought this was the number one upset all over again. He dominated the day with 220 combined yards, two touchdowns, 184 of those yards were rushing. That's a whopping 6.5 yards against the Patriots, one of the best defenses in the league. He was the first player to be the AFC Player of the Week since Eric freaking Medcalf, another throwback Thursday that we did, and that was pre the move, so it's been a long time. He would have another doozy of a game and single-handedly 
pretty much beat the Panthers, scoring three touchdowns and having 330 yards while receiving 60. The only other person that did that was Marshall Falk. Number 40, you see him all the time after this season. On game day, there's always Hillis jerseys all around Cleveland. This guy would finish the season with 270 carries for 1,177 yards and 11 touchdowns, and then he would chip in 61 receptions for almost 500 yards and another two two TDs. And what do you get out of this? Huh, no Pro Bowl, no All-Pro, but wait. He, j- he did get something. He was Cleveland's Madden boy. During and due to that breakout season, Hillis was a Browns finalist for the Madden NFL 12, so 2012 cover. After upsetting, up, upsetting Ray Rice, who he got drafted way higher than him that year in 2008, Matt Ryan and Super Bowl MVP, Aaron Rodgers, he advanced to the finals where he faced Mike Vick. On April 27, 2011, Peyton Hillis was announced cover athlete for the game, beating out Mike Vick with 66% of the vote. So, would he beat the curse? The short answer is not even close. It beat him so bad that the curse reinvented itself. And I'll tell you how it went after we hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Bodden Sports. Browns fans, Bodden Sports is your one-stop shop for all your athletic gear. Bodden started out perfecting and manufacturing the best balls in the business. Yeah, if that sounded dirty, that's more about your mind than my words. But hey, it's true. Baseball, softballs, footballs, basketballs, volleyballs, soccer balls, you name it. And Bodden has engineered the highest standard sports balls available. And now they offer more than just sports balls. If you got kids playing baseball or softball, Bodden has batting gloves and bats to go along with both game balls and training balls. If you're into basketball, Bodden makes basketball specifically for indoor or outdoor use. Heck, Bodden even has all the equipment you need for pickleball, which is one sport that I hear everyone is playing and yet I still never have. And I need to fix that soon. But don't miss the backyard game section of Bodden's website where you can order everything you need for this upcoming outdoor season. Pool balls, backyard volleyball, nets, croquet, bocce, horseshoes, cornhole, and more. Right now, you can get 10% off your entire order at Bodden Sports, B-A-D-E-N Sports dot com slash dogs, D-A-W-G-S, and use promo code dogs when you check out. That's 10% off all the top quality sporting gear you need this season. Bodden Sports dot com slash dogs. We are back and it is 2011 and here's kind of how things rolled out ever since he got on the Madden cover. 2011, Mangini is fired. Now we're Pat Shermer. Those are two of my most unfavorite coaches in Browns history, I think. But that's neither here nor there as well. So he tried to renegotiate his contract. Setting poor connection with fans, media, and teammates. The fans really wanted him resigned. The media took every chance to cut him down. He frustrated the team by missing games, charity events, ran into hammy issues, and he would finish the year, and this was his best year since the cover, with 585 yards and three touchdowns. In 2012, the Browns they didn't offer him a contract, so he became a free agent. He followed Dable, who got fired, to Kansas City, and he had 309 yards on 85 carries. And what happened that year? Another guy that got drafted ahead of him, Jamal Charles. That's what happened. Hillis then lasted three months the next year in Tampa Bay, where he was going to maybe be drafted originally. Isn't that bizarre? But he didn't even last the preseason. He was cut, and then he would be signed on a month later. And this would be his last hurrah with the Giants. Two years, 16 games, 362 yards, two TDs. He held in 26 receptions for 183 yards, then was released by the Giants on February 25th, 2015. He would retire, claiming his heart just wasn't into it anymore. So he resurfaces 2020, starts a podcast for Clevelanders. Lots of to do with Cleveland sports talk. Did anybody listen to this? I want to get your thoughts. 
I thought he was okay. I thought he sounded really good. There were some interesting takes that he had. His view on Baker Mayfield. In 2020, he was like, I'm not sure the Browns are going to commit to him. The guy carries too much baggage. But if they do, he's got a rocket arm and he can do it. Well, we saw where that went. He also had his views on the Cleveland media. They'll cut you down and they'll do whatever they can to make a story that's negative. Oh, they hit that nail on the head as well. In a PR move, though, and I think it was a pretty good one, um, he went on a show, the, I think it's the Afternoon Drive with Bull and Fox, and he basically went over that 2010 season and went through a bunch of questions by those guys. He thought he was lucky and blessed. He gave the head coach a lot of credit for that season that he had. He wished he would have made some different choices, but, you know, what can you do? Podcast, it was plugged. It was called Moving the Chains at the time. I believe there's another podcast called that, so probably had to switch that up. He did believe that the Browns didn't really want to give him a contract and kind of let him on. Um He said that they were kind of offering it media-wise, but not really doing it. One thing that he did lament, he should have played through the strep throat. He was said he was kind of young and dumb, but always loved Cleveland and always finds any excuse to come back. He wished he would have retired a Brown. I only had one problem. I listened to the whole thing, and they brought up that charity issue that charity thing that i mentioned earlier now this was specifically by le charles bentley who i don't know if he saw any snaps by the brown but he was highly touted buckeye signed by the browns and uh, ran into some surgery issues this was well documented in most media uh they brought that up he said he had no recollection of what they were talking about now i find it extremely odd that you would have no recollection when you through many sources apologized one being uh the cleveland browns newspaper in the the plain dealer and uh i find that so crazy but again uh, maybe he forgot i mean as far as the podcast went uh they were great uh they went from apple to Twitter live and then they were done January 2021 and if you guys know what happened to him if you just quit or I'm not sure uh, I'd like to know but there's nothing that I could find about it this guy he even in 2021 this dude did a movie and it was a horror movie it was called the hunting he was actually the lead it was shot in the land by Cleveland native Mark Andrew Hammer now this is another strange one where okay I'm not an actor I don't know how it goes This guy all of a sudden just pops up in a movie. He's the lead. Don't you act in a couple things? He has no credits anywhere that I can find. Somebody just decided, hey, Peyton Hillis, I want you in a movie. It's going to be a horror movie. It's going to be about werewolves. You're the lead. He hasn't done anything since. That is so bizarre. The last year, or what a last year, the 223 year, it was reported that he was in critical condition after saving his young niece and son from drowning. Man, what a what a hero. Like this guy risked his own life to save those two, those two that were the most important to him. He was released from the hospital after three weeks. And then he expects to make a full recovery. And what ends up happening? He's at Cleveland Stadium in December, smashing a guitar. And being honored in the game. What an odd, odd life this guy's had. But there it is. That's that's what his life. Like it was small, it was fast. And um I don't know what your guys' thoughts are. I, I like to hear. I the word that comes to mind for me is the guy was an enigma. And if you don't know what that is, kind of mysterious, puzzling, hard to understand. And I mean, there's a lot of internet opinion on him. I would say, though, uh, some of these things I'm going to tell you are a little bit older. His appearance on Bull and Fox, uh, the afternoon drive, I think that amended a lot of things for a lot of Browns fans. I think people really liked hearing that he wanted to retire a Brown and that he wanted to uh, get to Cleveland as much as possible. I mean, he made a movie here for Pete's sakes, but... Uh, from what I could read, a lot of people thought he had an ego. One guy specific said, I don't know for sure, but it seemed like he got into a state of I made it 
and it takes a lot to make it to the top. It takes even more to stay there. And it seemed like he said to himself, oh, I made it. I'm good. I'm quit. Um, there's no way that uh, I could know for sure. But as an outsider looking in, that's my take on it. Ah, I can see that a bit maybe. Um, here's another one. He's got some personality issues. The Browns released him and he was, never was the same. You know what? Mental illness is a tough one. Uh, if you look at the traits of being depressed, he definitely exhibited that in the 2011 season. Uh, There's some manic things there where he's high and low. That could be too. I'm not a therapist. Here's another one. This will, this guy's super straight. Fluke, douchiness, Madden, injuries, and laziness. That's what got him. Peyton Hillis was an axe murderer as he hit people, but he also benefited from Lawrence Vickers as a lead balker. And when he didn't have him, you saw the rest of his career. Also, he had Brian Dable as a head coach or as an offensive coordinator. And while he was a terrible offensive coordinator, this is what he's. This is probably from two fifteen. He makes good fantasy running back. So take a look at this. Jerome Harrison with the Browns, Dable as quarter as a coordinator. Career year, 863 yards, 220 receiving, 17 touchdowns. Mediocre, but that was the best he did. Peyton Hillis, 1177, 477 yards, 13 TDs. Reggie Bush would have a career year with Dable with 100 1,086 yards rushing, almost 300 yards receiving, and seven TDs. And then 2012, the guy that was playing ahead of Peyton were Dable and Dable, 1,509 yards, to almost 250 yards receiving, and six total touchdowns. So, I mean, my thoughts on saying it all, like I said, he's an enigma. He was hard to understand. He also was a small-town boy, and he had all the ability, but when I... The one thing that got to me is when I heard him talk, I heard him talk about the Browns, heard him talk about the Cavs, and I heard him talk about the Indians. He had a lot of enjoyment talking about the Indians, and I wonder if his passion was really baseball, but he could go farther with football. And that may have lacked some drive when things weren't going his way. The other thing that I thought is when he was talking negatively and it was mainly about football is because baseball didn't really promise him or make broken promises about contracts that he didn't get. Also, the manic nature of his career, he had a lot of ups and downs. There could be some mental, mental wellness things there as well. But the one thing I did find is that he was a little bit like Bo Callahan. If you look, he was a bit of a loner. I didn't see any positive teammate feedback through many of the articles I read to put this together. Now, funny enough, uh, Bo Callahan was not based on the way that uh, Peyton Hillis was acting. If you guys actually look, it was Connor Cook, a quarterback for Michigan State. Um, that's a wrap, though. So you can check out Peyton Hillis. He's on Instagram at Peyton Hillis official Instagram. He's also on X uh, at the Peyton Hillis. He's got tons of followers. You can check out his stuff. You can comment on this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Peyton Hillis. Let me know what you think of the episode. Also, give me some ideas. I said this last week. Don't be shy on those subscriptions. Guys, have a great week and let's go Browns. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at the Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Danger Coffee. Browns fans, we talk about how Danger Coffee is made free from mold toxins that are in 45% of the world's coffee, but that's not all that Danger Coffee has to offer. Mineral and nutrient deficiencies are a big deal. They make you feel sick, tired, stressed, and they can give you brain fog. These deficiencies negatively affect your immune system, your digestion, sleep, metabolism. Have you ever wondered why you get an initial burst from your coffee? 
but then you get that little crash not long after, Danger Coffee's patent pending process remineralizes your body with more than 50 trace minerals and electrolytes, leaving you more energized, engaged, powerful. These micronutrients enter the cells to boost performance. They bind to toxins to provide detoxification support. I know that sounds like a lot, but the bottom line, guys, is minerals matter. And most of us really don't get enough of them on a daily basis. Danger Coffee delivers micronutrients, plus it gives you access to the minerals you already have. Head to DangerCoffee.com, use our code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, for 10% off your order. And that code can be used over and over. So you get 10% off every order you make using code DOGS. It's time to start every day off with a cup of coffee that gets you going and actually keeps you going. DangerCoffee.com. Code dogs.